Well, last week, <laughs> I talked to you about hastening the coming of the Lord, and we went into the areas of authority that we don't have authority over people, but we have authority over the spirits that will can motivate people. If there's something moving against them. And in our own space, we have authority. When Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves, he rebuked it in so much as it had an effect on him in the vicinity where he was. He didn't rebuke the winds and waves over the whole earth, but those that were in his vicinity. So we walk in that authority. And I want to continue somewhat along these lines. We're talking about hastening the coming of the Lord from the, uh, the apostle Peter spoke about that we're hastening the coming of the Lord. And so it's been, uh, it's been a while since the, the Lord has impressed upon my spirit to get the church ready, get the church ready since October. And the spirit of God's been saying, get the church ready. Who's the church? We are. I am. You are. Get the church ready. What do we need to get the church ready for? Well, as I told you, I, I found another package of prophecies that my dad had, had given. And I think it's important that we lay hold on these things. There's a couple of different things I need you to know about these prophetic words. Um, conventional thinking would say that these prophetic words that were delivered in a church or a seminar or whatever, that these prophetic words were for the people in that church. And they, they were. And conventional thinking would tell you that um, people would have listened to it and gotten excited and praised the Lord and, and left and may not have ever thought about it again. Then again, the Lord had me find these things in a box, another box. There's no coincidences. So when I picked these up, the first thing that the Lord said to me as I picked it up is these are for today. Even though where they might have been given 40 years ago, these are for today. In the same way that the birth of the Messiah was prophesied hundreds of years before it took place. So what's, what's one of the things we need to recognize as I go back and read a prophecy from 40 years ago. It is that one of the important things about prophesying and speaking these things about the body of Christ, you do realize these prophecies are not about like a world war or something like that. These prophecies are about what's going to happen to the body of Christ. And it happened a little, but not a whole lot. So it never got completely fulfilled. It it had an effect, but it didn't become fulfilled. But one of the things that I want to point out here is that it was the speaking and declaring of this word that set the blueprint that made the path for it to come to pass. How many of you believe that there's power in words? Yes. yes. How many of you know that Charles Caffs taught on words? <laughs> How many of you know Charles Caffs believed that what he said would come to pass? Yes, because that's the key element of Mark eleven twenty three is and believeth that whatsoever you say will come to pass. So he believed what he said would come to pass, and it's evident from finding hundreds of prophecies that prophesied about what was going to happen to the body of Christ that he believed. This was going to happen. And when he'd get under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this would come out about what's going to happen with the body of Christ. So I want to read one that really jumped out at me. This prophetic word was given in Joplin, Missouri. It does not have a date. Uh, it's going to be between probably 1977 and 79. It says, My anointing shall flow in the area of healing in the latter days beyond what it has been in days before. The cloud of my glory shall be seen in the midst of meetings such as this, and it will be so that whole multitudes will fall prostrate and be healed, every one of all diseases 
and sicknesses. Oh, it will begin to be small at first here and there. You'll hear it here and you'll hear it there and it'll grow and it'll multiply. And it'll come because the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And I, I never heard this before. This was a new one. On, uh, it'll be because the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. Those are two gifts of the spirit. Everybody know that? Yes. Those are two of the gifts of the spirit. The word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and the principles of my word are being taught throughout the earth. You see, when the knowledge of my word comes forth in revelation, it releases my ability in the earth. He's talking about the word and the revelation of the word. Now, we all know that because of the Internet, the word is being preached everywhere. But all the word that's being preached is not revelation of the word. I'll let that sit on you a minute. All the word that's being preached from the pulpits and on the Internet is not the revelation of the word of God. OK, but it says the revel because of the revelation of the word, it releases the ability of God in the earth. And things that have not happened in days past will surely come to pass in your generation. So shall it be brought forth in your generation for the knowledge of my word shall come alive. It will come as revelation and light beams from the throne of God to the hearts of men anointed to teach the word of God. It will come as light beams of revelation. Great healings. I hear a lot about the, the prophetic that he talks about, but this is anointing shall flow in the area of healing beyond what we have expected. And I've watched lately and... I've seen people praying, you know, laying hands on the sick. I've seen the uh, healing anointing coming um, in church services that I've watched. And yet I'm very well aware that we ain't there yet. We're not there yet. We believe in healing. We have the revelation of the word about healing. And yet we don't aren't seeing those instantaneous miracles like I know in my spirit are going to happen. How many of you have that sense that it's going to take place? Okay. So Charles Capps declared these things prophetically and spoke them out loud. And those words that he spoke did not fall to the ground. He spoke them under the anointing. Those words that were spoken are still out here in the atmosphere. And the plan and purpose of God for these things that was revealed through the prophetic word are waiting, are waiting for complete fulfillment, just like the, the words of the prophets were waiting for the complete fulfillment and the physical birth of the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Those words for hundreds of years were here in the atmosphere, here in the atmosphere. And yet there was a time and a place when something took something happened and there was a young girl named Mary that said be unto me according to your word Lord and accepted that and again as I've spoken to you about Abraham how many people did God go to before he went to Abraham and said I want to cut a covenant with you and how many didn't say yes is Abraham the only person that was approached I don't know is Mary the only one that was approached I don't know all I know is this that as a member of the body of Christ and as the church, I am saying, I want to receive those light beams of revelation. I want to receive of the spirit. I want to partake of these, these meetings where the glory of God comes and everyone is healed. I want to partake of that. I want to see it. And so, so today I want us to start in the book of Ephesians chapter five and we're going to we're going to talk about yielding to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Ephesians five and verse nineteen. Now I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, and it says, Well, let's back again. Here we go again, back up to 18. We can back up to verse 1, but let's back up to 18 here. 
It says that do not get drunk with wine for that is excess or debauchery or it says, um, anyway, it's a bad thing. <laughs> but be filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. Be filled constantly with the Spirit. What was happening here in this church? They came together perhaps to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. And the, the shift was from honoring the covenant of the Lord until it became a party. It became a social thing. And some of them were drunk at the, the gathering of the body of Christ. And they missed the whole point. Said, you know, you're not to be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he continues and he says, addressing or speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now, let's go to actually the Greek in that. My hands are cold. It doesn't want to pop up. In Jesus' name, obey me. <laughs> All right. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let's just let's just take a look at that. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. There's some things that have been left behind, some things that are not understood by this generation, some things that we're missing in the body of Christ today. And God said, get the church ready. Here's one of it. The songs of the spirit. What is he talking about? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What is he talking about? There are songs that the Spirit once brought forth in this time and in this age and in this hour. There are songs of the Spirit. Do you remember hearing, um, I wish I could tell you exactly where it is, but when the children of Israel were taken captive, their, ca their captors said, sing those songs that we used to hear. And they said, they hung their harps, it says, on the willow trees. and said, how can we sing the song of the Lord in, the, in a strange land? We have nothing to rejoice over. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in this strange land? Well, there's an interesting, there's an interesting idea here, which is believed by many primitive people. And I happen to know a man that I've talked about before that is uh, of the Pueblo tribe. And he talked about <clears throat> the land and the importance of the land and how that the land itself and the vegetation, and he's talking about the land here. The land, he said, taught us our native language, our Tiwa language. Now, isn't it it's interesting because I never thought of it that way before. But you go and you find all these different people in different parts of the world and they speak different languages. Well, yes, we know that at the Tower of Babel, the, the languages were confused, but it's an interesting concept when you relate it to Israel and the song of their land. I want you to think about, I know this is new stuff. Brace yourself. I'm going to say things maybe you hadn't heard before, but just think about it. How can we sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? The song that they sang of victory belonged in the land of Israel, in the nation of Israel. There is a, a song that comes forth, and there's a song that's wanting to come forth in the church today. There's a song that's wanting to come forth from the United States today. There are songs of the Spirit. They are not the songs of um, our our old hymnals necessarily all hail the power of Jesus name although that's a great one but there are songs given by the spirit and so we need to recognize that music plays a very important part in the prophetic word Use, music plays an important part in the body of Christ 
And all I've been seeing for quite some time is formatted, what I call formatted singing, formatted song services. And yes, that we get excited and the songs are pretty good, you know, but there's a different song. Speaking to one another in Psalms, does everybody know what Psalms are? The poetry of the Psalmist David, but those were sung to God. God, how great you are. You are right, my rock, my fortress. These are Psalms. There's hymns that recognize the, the greatness of God. And there are spiritual songs. Now, the next thing he says, singing and making melody or harmony from, it says, to the Lord with your heart. That actually, when I'm, I can get the Greek up here, <laughs> it actually means harmonizing with that in your heart. And then you sing it forth from your mouth. If it's important that you speak the word with your mouth, how much more important is it that you sing the word with your mouth? <laughs> now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Um, David Ingalls is a psalmist, and he sang the songs of the Spirit. Now, many of you probably weren't in the meetings. I was in the meetings. Mom was in the meetings. When Brother Hagen would get up and he would have a revelation from the Lord and he would begin to teach the word and the spirit of God would move upon him and God would give him some type of a phrase or something that he repeat. And he'd say, Brother Ingalls, come up here. And Brother David Ingalls would come up there and he'd hit the chord and he began to sing the song of the spirit. What do I mean song of the spirit? It was one he didn't memorize. It was one he'd never heard before. He sang out of the in, innermost part of his being and began to sing unto the Lord. And as he did, the glory of God would fill the place. Now, this is going even further back, okay? But in the very early days, Many of you probably don't even know who Buddy Harrison is. You've heard of Harrison House. Buddy Harrison was the founder of Harrison House. But Buddy would be at Brother Hagin's meetings, and Brother Hagin would preach, and the Spirit of God would come upon Buddy in an entirely different way than it came upon David Ingalls, and Buddy would begin to dance before the Lord and sing out. You remember that, Jane? I do. Powerful move of the Spirit. Those are songs of the Spirit, and we're missing that today. I've noticed, I think I've even asked people, you know, does anybody sing in the Spirit anymore in church? And I remember when I came into this, when the Spirit of God began to move years ago, there would be 3,000, 5,000 people in an auditorium and the Spirit of God would begin to move and bring forth the song of the Spirit. Now, what I mean by singing in the Spirit is singing in tongues. Singing in tongues. Lord, I worship you. I magnify your name. Holy are you, Lord. Deso. Comes from the end song comes from the inside. You know what happens when crowds of 3,000 and 5,000 people begin to sing in the Spirit? You take up space. You take up spiritual space in the kingdom of God, and you're actually standing in authority because you're taking up space that's occupied by those other spirits that I talked about, by the wicked spirits in heavenly places. You are occupying space and so what i see happening and has happened today I, I see an effort to try to get congregations to sing in the spirit and they don't know what to do it's like okay now from your heart harmonizing in your heart it's just it's a harmony that comes and it's stack layer upon layer and i've been in in meetings where the spirit was moving like that and people were singing in a heavenly language and it came up one layer and then two layers and then three layers. And at some point in that service, there was a super, more supernatural layer that came and it was the angelic choir joining in. 
and you knew when it happened. You knew when it happened, and the glory of God would fill the place. Now, if the church wants the glory of God, if we want to see the glory of God, we have to make an opening. When I wrote this book, Spirit of Prophecy, God spoke to me, and he said, you put the parts in there about the importance of the prophets in the music ministry, the importance of the music ministry. And as you can tell, I am not a musician. I am not a musician, but I recognize the power of music. I said, put it in there. Put it in there. Begin to bring this forth. And the reason is because if we're going to see the true glory of God, we have to know how to enter his presence. We have to know how to make an opening for his glory to appear. And whether it's, my dad said, you, you know, whether it's the glory of God coming and people falling and everyone being healed. This is, a, this, if you've never seen a typewriter, this is what the typewritten page looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, the glory of God comes when you worship him out of your spirit and out of your heart, with your mouth, but also the singing, the singing. There's great singing in heaven. Now, singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to your, the Lord with your heart. I want to be careful how I say this, but I don't want to say you will never. But I would be shocked if the glory of God comes in when you're singing about yourself. Mm. And I hear all the time, church, this, this, we're supposed to be worshiping the Lord. It ain't worship. It ain't got anything to do with worship. It's about me and what I did and this and that and the other. And, and, it, and some of it's emotional. And, you know, I realize that, you know, there's a lot that goes on. But that's that's fine i mean there's there are places for those kinds of singing but you're not going to get the glory of god that i've ever seen to come into a place and you're unless you are absolutely tuned into the worship of the father and you go to chronicles and you find at the dedication of the temple as they all came together and began to minister to each other no as they ministered to the Lord, as they minister, what is ministering to the Lord? Singing of his glory, of his grace, worshiping him with gratitude, entering into that worship of who he is. Then it said the glory of the Lord filled the place where the priest couldn't even stand up to minister because the glory of God was so strong. So it's time that we get our music straightened out. Speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is wonderful. It's wonderful. In, in my opinion, a great deal of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are actually the prophetic gift. And it could be tongues and interpretation. And the reason that I say that is that as you sing the songs of the Spirit, then you may begin to interpret the song of the Spirit that you're singing. And sometimes you just begin to sing it and sing the English words or the words that are known to you by the Spirit. And you say, well, how does that happen? Does the Holy Ghost just take over me? No. Let's talk about that a minute. That's one of the areas that we talked about last week, and I'm going to drag my little board over here. And I want to talk about yielding to the Holy Spirit. Yes, we're talking about singing in the Spirit, but I also want to talk about how do, how do you do that? You know, when I watch the pastor say, now let's all sing in the Spirit. People are going, what is that song? Yeah. What, what, are the, what are the words to that song? What are, and you say, well, how can you have 3,000 people all singing different songs? It's because it's by the Spirit. It's the Spirit is the, is the choir director, and he leads. All right, so you remember last week we talked about people 
And we talked about we don't have authority over people. Guess who else doesn't have authority over people? God. Why? Because what did I say? We're autonomous. We choose. So on on this side, I, I, I painted the spirit that's trying to mm -hmm. influence somebody, right? Remember that? It's not, we're not taking authority over this person. We're taking authority over this spirit that's operating through this person against me or against the church or against my pastor or against this person or that person. We're taking authority over this spirit, okay? Now, this, these spirits are malicious. These spirits have evil intent. Now, this could be something like a lying spirit. What does a lying spirit do? Does it make this person lie? Well, could. It also could lie to this person and tell them things that are untrue. Have any of you ever believed a lie? Nobody's raising their hand. I have. I have. But the intent, it's malicious. They want to destroy you, whether lying to you or tempting you with wine and drink, which is debauchery. And why would they do that? Well, you know, these, these are the spirits that lead people into addiction. So what's the point there? Why do they do that? because they have no other way to manifest. That person that's addicted is feeding that spirit. Mm -hmm. That disembodied spirit is being fed mm -hmm. by that person. And over here, let's say, how shall I draw the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Holy Spirit is everywhere. Holy Spirit is everywhere. So if we're born again of the Spirit of God, there's one, there's actually, there's actually one, one power that we have personally. I'm not talking about the power of God. There's one power that each of us has personally. And that power is the power of choice. Mm -hmm. That's it. The devil can't make you choose. God can't make you choose. Only you can make you choose. Only you can decide. Do I listen to this or do I listen to the Holy Spirit? And I'm going to put Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit is outward. Holy Spirit is in here. So am I going to listen to all these? There's voices everywhere. Which voice am I going to listen to? I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this will seek to control you. The Holy Spirit, I'm gonna, let's write it out. Holy Spirit will never seek to force you to do anything. He's not going to force you to pray in tongues. He's not going to force you to, to sing in the Spirit. He's not going to force you to do anything because he is not malicious. He is the comforter. He is our counselor, our helper, our advocate. So let's just say that we've been born again and we're not going to we're not going to listen to this anymore. All right. So, now we have the choice. Are we going to keep our mouth shut? <laughs> Are we going to worry about what everybody thinks? Are we going to yield to the Holy Spirit? Let's talk about being filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues. Many years ago, it was believed that you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for maybe months, years, and then wrestled with the Holy Spirit. And finally, one day, the Holy Ghost took your tongue and made you speak in tongues. And so people... You know, I remember hearing the story of one person that said, is it, are there any words coming up? I laid hands on you for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are any words coming up? Yeah. It's all I can do to keep from saying it. 
But see, there's a choice. Yeah. There's a choice. Am I going to speak or am I not going to speak? It's as simple as when you're speaking in tongues. Are, are you going to confess Jesus as the Lord of your life or are you going to continue to serve the devil? I choose Jesus. Okay. Mm-hmm. That was your power. You had the power of choice. All right. Somebody lays hands on you and says, I'm going to lay hands on you for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hands are laid upon you. Are you going to speak or not speak? Are you going to open your mouth or are you going to grit your teeth? Tell you a story. I had an unusual experience when I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old. It was highly unusual. My sister and I were out in a bean field. And I mean, we just had the power of God hit. We fell out under the power and... Uh, I was speaking in tongues. The preacher's daughter was speaking in tongues and Beverly was crying. I didn't know why at the time, but I found out after I was able to actually get up off the, pull myself up off the ground, she said she wasn't saved. So I led her to the Lord. She confessed Jesus and began to speak in tongues. Now, those unusual outpourings of the spirit are great. And that happened a lot in past days. All right. But that didn't always happen. It didn't always happen to everybody. So I also didn't know after I was filled with the Spirit and spoke fluently in other tongues as an eight-year-old, I did not know that was something I was to continue to do. Mm-hmm. That Back then in those days in our church, it was like it happened to you. Yes, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But unless you felt the power come on you, you didn't speak in tongues. Well, now we know differently. We can speak out of our spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go like a you know, bird flying off a limb. The Holy Spirit's within us. And so by the time I was maybe 13 or 14, I guess, I went to church camp and had an experience with God and I spoke in tongues again, but I just got one word, one word. And I thought, you know, that's great, but I don't think that's all of it. I don't think that's, I'm supposed to be stuck on having one word by the Spirit. And so I made up my mind that every day at a certain time, I was going to go into our storm shelter, which was a quiet place, right? Every day I was going to go there and I was going to pray until I become fluent in speaking in tongues. Now you say, who taught you that? The Holy Spirit. Nobody taught me that. I didn't know that. It wasn't in our church. We didn't know that. And I went down there every day until I began to have the development of a prayer language. And over the years, you'll notice that uh, I'm, this is not condemnation of anybody <laughs> at all, but you'll notice that that people have a certain prayer language, you know, and, and that's that's okay. But what I'm here to tell you today is there's a whole lot more than that. There's a whole lot more than that. And so over the years, I noticed that as we were interceding or as we were praying and I was yielding myself to the Spirit of God, I made the choice to yield. I made the choice to speak. I made the choice that I felt like, you know, there's another language. There's another language that will more accurately and adequately cover this prayer that I have. And I'm going to speak it. That's good. So... So how did you do that? I'm going to give you a demonstration right here. So I'm praying for someone or or a situation or whatever. Let's say we're we're praying for a particular situation, maybe even a nation or a country or a situation. So I'm praying. Oh, And on the inside, I'm going, okay, yeah, yeah. There's something else. There's something else here. Something else. Show me what it is, Lord. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. What is that language that you want me to speak? You see the difference Mm -hmm. in the language? Now, what language was that? I have no idea. I have no idea. 
But as I yielded myself to the Holy Spirit, different languages came out at different times. Everybody still here? Is everybody okay? I hope everybody's still there on YouTube watching. These are things that I'm just sharing from my personal storehouse of experience today. And so the Holy Spirit did not make me do that. But I tapped into the... Do you have any idea how many things are in the Spirit we hadn't touched yet? Yeah. Now, the other day, this is sort of what Dad used to call off-the-cuff stuff, right? <laughs> I'm just talking to you today. The other day, I was in a, a, a prayer meeting, and a meeting, and some things happened, and there was an unusual manifestation that if you just looked at it from the intellectual point of view, you would go, that's off. I mean, you would really go, that's off. But I'm standing there, and I'm listening to this, and the Spirit, I sense the Spirit of God manifesting. The Spirit of God's manifesting there. And I knew that that was the Spirit. So how do you know? How do you know these things that are happening? It's when you identify with the Spirit. Over the weekend, <laughs> So it was a weekend for funerals. And over the weekend, Brianne and I were at two different funerals. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, there was sort of a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit at the first funeral. And it was by the Spirit of God. And it was, you know, it's like the way you know, it's like warm honey. It's soothing it just it's just soothing the word that's being spoken. I'm not talking about prophetic words about what's going to happen in the last days. I'm talking about to edify, to exhort, and to comfort. Yeah. In First Corinthians 14, it tells us that the prophetic word, now I'm talking about just general prophecy. I'm not talking about specific calling of a prophet, but general prophecy is given to edify, exhort, and comfort. It's to build up, right? And so this word that came forth at this funeral it was like honey being poured over the crowd and it was comfortable and it was peaceable and it was a gentle thing. And I thought, wow, we have really limited, you know, how many of you have ever been to a funeral and saw the gifts of the spirit in operation? <laughs> Not much, no, but it was, and it brought peace to people and it was a blessing. And so then we went to another another one and when we left and i may sh I may share a little bit but but when we when we left brianne we walked out and brianne said wow the spirit of god was really there the presence of the lord <clears throat> and you know i know she didn't think anything about it she just you know but that really blessed me because how many people go and don't know that what they felt was the presence of the lord <clears throat> I mean, the presence of the Lord was there in that place. And so supernatural things, all supernatural is not of God, but sometimes even supernatural things that seem, appear odd, but you feel the Spirit of God. You feel the Spirit of God. That's how you judge it. All right. I've only gotten to one scripture so far. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians 3 and 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I love this scripture. Teaching and admonishing each other and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and grace singing in your hearts to the Lord. Do you see the connection here between Ephesians? <laughs> okay. Let the word of Christ, what are you prophesying? Are you prophesying who's going to win the OSU OU ball game? Are you prophesying who's going to win the horse race? Are you prophesying who's going to win the World Series? Are you prophesying? No. It's from the word of Christ. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The songs will be from the word, from the life of God. Let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And use wisdom. You might not want to break out singing in the spirit in the middle of Walmart. Then again, yeah. <laughs> who knows? God might tell you to, but you use wisdom. It says teaching and admonishing. Who's he writing to? The church at Ephesus. Teaching and admonishing each other. How? In mm -hmm. psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, that's the spiritual songs. The songs of the spirit. So when you come together, and here's what I, uh, now we're getting down to nitty gritty. When we come together, I'm not the only person in this room who can prophesy. And the last time I said that, Brianne went, hey, man. <laughs> but it's true. I'm not the only one that can prophesy. I'm not the only one who can have a word from the Lord. Right. And so one of the ways in which God wants to get his church ready is he wants to get every one of us yielding to the Holy Spirit as he speaks through us to minister to the rest of the body. I can't speak to the entire body of Christ. But you see, as it multiplies exponentially and we all minister to each other and minister out, then the body can become mature and be where they're supposed to be. Not too long ago, the Spirit of God was here. I felt just his, the presence of the Holy Spirit here, and he was wanting to say something through someone. And I asked if someone had something to say, and no one said a word. And I don't know if it's because you think it's not the appropriate time or, or if it's frightening to you. I can tell you that when I first started moving out in the gifts of the Spirit, I didn't know what to do either. I just get the I get the interpretation of a message in tongues and I go, ooh, what does that mean? <laughs> and it took a period of time when I, I I told my dad how it happened because it was odd with me when I the message in tongues was coming out, I would read it like it was a headline on a newspaper. And I go, oh wow. What does that mean? Well, it was the interpretation of tongues is what it was, but I had to learn to operate it in it. Now, there's two things that will hinder you. <clears throat> I drew big today, so let's flip it over here. Two things that will hinder. Well, actually, it's one thing. And it's called the ego. <clears throat> Not the devil, the ego everybody's going oh no i don't want to hear this okay you've got two things that sideline the gifts of the spirit the ego and one is i want to be seen i've seen that happen a lot okay and the second one is I don't want to be seen. <laughs> and the underlying is maybe I'm wrong. Right. Yes. Okay. And actually, if you're scared and you're thinking this is a better place to be than that. <laughs> Okay, I got to wind this up. Maybe we go into this. But the ego, this is where you have to be like Jesus, okay? Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself mm -hmm. to the death of the cross. And you be like Jesus and not the devil. And the devil said, I'm as good as God and I'll exalt myself above the stars of God. And he was cast down, so he cast, Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning cast down out of heaven. So you're better to be up here than you are to be up there, which is 
I know all of these things. All right, conclude, Annette. All right, so here it is. I was in meetings and there was a woman that operated in the gifts of the spirit and sometimes it was right on, sometimes it wasn't. And, but I had a big wrestling thing with this whole deal because as I was in this, seeing all this stuff that was going on, this spirit kept coming to me and going, as this ego thing was manifesting in this person, this ego thing tried to manifest in me. Mm. Oh yeah, I know y'all thought I didn't have an ego. Ha ha. No, this <laughs> ego thing tried to manifest in me. And this book, this is this said, You've had a lot more people healed under your ministry. You've had a lot more people fall out under the power. You've waved your hand and 200 people went down under the power of God. So go in there at that meeting tonight and show everybody that, that you've got more anointing than she does. I'm telling you the truth. This is not a story. This, this, is, this is a reality that happened to me. And you know what I did? I took myself down here somewhere and I said, I'm going to go teach the word and I will not move in the gifts of the spirit. I'm not entering this. I will not listen to you. And that thing came after me day after day. It was like a week. This thing came after me. And the more it came after me, the more I just preached the word, preached the word, preached the word. I preached the word, preached the word. And when it came time to pray for the sick or whatever, I'd go, Let's stand and pray. And that's how I dealt with this. Now, was this me? Partially this was me, but this was also this spirit right here trying to get me to succumb. Very good. And I wouldn't do it. And I will never do it. I refuse 